Greetings, this is Paul the Poke from paulthepoke.com. We have an operational update, Russia and Ukraine, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We are March 1st, 2022. Uh, we're going to start with a map of Ukraine, You're right in the middle, Kiev, the capital, Kharkiv, another major city, uh, one of the two largest cities in Ukraine. We got some action in and around there. Um, we're going to talk about uh, now. First of all, we're just going to operational update. What's going on? Well, that just depends on who you're talking to. Uh, now, this is one that was pulled from uh, February 28th, 2022, and this is from uh, oh, this would be the. Um, Institute for the Study of War is a policy research organization focused on U.S. national security. And the Russian military is reorganizing its efforts in an attempt to remedy poor planning and execution based on erroneous assumptions about Ukrainians. Will, they're the Ukrainians' will and ability to resist. Now, if you want to read the report, you can click on this link. Check it out and see what they have to say about it. And the main thing with a lot of these posts is just providing people with resources, different perspectives to look at instead of what we're fed by the, uh, quote, mainstream ma media and what's also being portrayed around the, around the world. I'm trying to find some actual real-life analysis of professionals who study this stuff and see what they're saying about it. And so... Um, this is the Institute for the Study of War. And again, your two Donetsk and Lugansk are the two areas that agreed to break away. Now, this is down in the south off the Crimea. Maripol, you'll read a lot of stuff in and around Maripol. And then also Kherson is another big sea, port sea area, as well as Odessa. And of course, things in red would indicate Russian um, occupation and... Um, Kiev here in the center, Kharkiv over here in the northeast, gathering a lot of attention. So again, if you want to read the report, I'll be honest, I've not read it. Don't plan on reading it. Things change very quickly. And this would have been as of yesterday, yesterday afternoon, um, around three. So this is, you know, roughly 24, 28 hours old information. But nonetheless, it's I find it to be a pretty good resource. Which will take us to NPR. Uh, logistic pro logistics problems are stalling a massive Russian convoy that's pushing its way toward Kiev. The convoy, which has been measured as stretching for 40 miles. So we have 40 miles of vehicles, military equipment, trucks, troops, 40 miles on a road is apparently being hampered by fuel and food shortages. So again, uh, logistical issues. Now, I will be the first one to admit, and I am open to listen to anybody about this. I have no experience in the military. Um, openly admit that. But the idea of stacking 40 miles of... Um, Military equipment on a road coming into Kiev just sounds like a really bad idea. And I mean, everything's just sitting there on the road. We have satellite images of this stuff. Uh, and you read some of the comments on uh, social media. And it's like, can you imagine if somebody were to try this going into a major city in the United States? I mean, it, they're sitting ducks. Um Heard several people, why don't you just line up some airplanes and just start mowing things down and stop it? Um, I don't know. Really question the strategy of this. Of course, I may be just misunderstanding it, but nonetheless, it's what they're doing. And apparently this thing has stalled and it's been stalled on the highway out there north of Kiev, what, three to four days now? Haven't made any progress. <laughs> I've seen stories of... of uh, <coughs> Tanks running out of diesel and people driving down the road 
stopping in front of a tank asking what's going on where are you going they say i know where we're waiting on diesel and then you know the the ukrainian says well we'll we'll tell you back to russia it's just craziness um and that just doesn't seem like a good strategy maybe it's a psychological operation hey we're trying to scare you we got 40 miles of trucks getting ready to come in here okay um and so there's that perspective on it and then this is rich okay so this is uh this is compliments of h h i sutton and again for those of you who are not familiar defense analysis submarines illustrations history author of covert shores books um <laughs> he's got great resources and then he he votes evidence this was three hours ago i had to laugh when i saw this evidence of russia's planned amphibious landings in ukraine and now this isn't a parent intelligence blunder by belarusian president alexander lukashenko on an international scale and if this is a blunder i would uh, guess the president of uh, belarus is about to be put on a very short leash in regards to information being released publicly um and a question zero this in make it a little bigger is the amphibious landings east of odessa advancing northwest toward transnistra now that's been speculated for the last few days and maybe he is releasing the fact that they are getting ready to do it or it is it is underway there was lots of conjecture and speculation but nonetheless this isn't something that had been public and he's the one who made it public um also some observations they uh according to president lukashenko's map here uh ukraine's been divided into four parts one two three and four that's moldova that doesn't count but they have four different areas that you know as far as belarus and russia see it they're looking to break ukraine into four separate areas so um i don't think he was supposed to do that but anyhow there's there's the breakdown as seen by president lukashenko we've looked at uh you know some press reports and um we've also taken a look at the uh institute for the study of war so there's there's that angle of it and then this is the one that's most concerning uh this came out yesterday and this is provided by india today i'm going to provide a link on the website at paulthepoke.com for people who want to read this or not read this but listen to this this is a three minute video uh discussing the quote father of all bombs will russia use father of all bombs against ukraine i'm gonna say the answer is yes uh, the title is can putin use thermo thermobaric bomb aka father of all bombs against ukraine so uh, again from india today link will be provided at paulthepoke.com or you can read this and look it up russia which has launched military action against ukraine has the father of all bombs in its weaponry the father of all bombs is the world's most powerful non-nuclear bomb here's all you need to know about foab um, is a thermobaric bomb comes by many names an aerosol bomb a vacuum bomb a fuel fuel air explosive a super powerful non-nuclear bomb that has a blast equivalent of more than 44 tons of tnt uh, can cause damage in a radius of 300 meters. Destructive weapon is dropped from a jet and detonates midair. It pulls oxygen out of the air and produces a similar effect to a small nuclear weapon. And if you're inside this 300 meter radius as a human being, you will be vaporized. Um, buildings just get pulverized uh just turn to dust i mean it, it is so destructive leaves a massive hole and then if you're also close to this there's like a sound wave and a percussion that that exudes from this which is which is deadly and then also if you're too close to this blast it will literally suck the air out of you 
um, and melt stuff on you. It's not a very nice thing. Now, Russia, for their part, has been denying the use of this. Um, it's been banned internationally. Uh, Russia, however, did not sign that agreement. I don't think uh, somebody else didn't sign it either. But but the point of it is it's it is ridiculously destructive. And so there's this out of Kharkiv. Um, look at that. I mean, it is, it is like a, a mushroom of fire. And if you could turn the sound on, you want to hear it. I mean, it's, it's crazy how loud it is. Knocks those shutters down, shakes the windows. They got to open it back up. It's only like 20 some seconds, um, near Kharkiv can't confirm what it was, but they think it was thermal barrack. And here it goes again. We'll watch this from the, from the top. I mean, look at that. I mean, you can see the sound waves coming off of that. And there was one that was uh, exploded last night that had the same same image. And it's it's a it's like a mushroom cloud of fire is the best way to describe it. Possibly one was shot off today. All you can see left were the remnants of the smoke, and whatever was there was gone. Uh, big hole, which takes me to. Zechariah 14 verse 12. Now, am I saying this is um, what this is in scripture? No, I'm not, but I do find it interesting. This is from the ESV. It's my personal favorite translation interpretation. Also like the NASB, I will look at all these different translations. Uh, King James, I'll look at that one as well. Uh, New Testament, I know enough Greek to get myself in trouble. And if all else fails, I'll defer to what the original Greek text states. And uh, Hebrew for me is a work in progress. And I do a lot of word studies. I don't, I, I loosely, very loosely understand the verb structure of it. But I try to get as many different perspectives on what it is that's trying to be said. And, um, and this plague shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the peoples that wage war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they are still standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouths. Um, now, obviously, if you're too close to this father of all bombs, you just get vaporized, but I'm sure there are some that are close by. Um, this is feasible, which is a little different than what you see in Ezekiel 38, 39, uh, that talks about bones being left over, which talking with my, my friend checkmate, he would concur that that is most likely a nuclear strike that would leave bones. This appears to be a little different. Um, I guess the word rot, I'd want to see what the will rot, decay, rot, fester, pine away, melt, uh, flow, dwindle, vanish. So it'll happen, you know, essentially pretty instantaneously that, um, their flesh will rot while they are still standing on their feet. So it'll be pretty instantaneously, whatever happens to these people that go up against Jerusalem. So anybody who wants to go do that, know that's coming, coming against you at some point in the future, at least a couple times too. Um, you see that same thing toward the very end of, um, uh, Revelation, when Satan's been loosed after his 1,000-year time out and fire rains down on all the people that come against Jerusalem there. So um, possibly a, a pattern of history, dual fulfillment, if you will. Um, but just something to think about. You know, again, again, am I saying this is what that bomb is? This bomb is the fulfillment of Zechariah 14, 12. No, I'm not. Uh, but it's curious. It's thought provoking and worth taking into consideration. Um, and then we're going to close. Well, going to close with a couple of things. Uh, not quite there yet. We're going to take a look at uh, Revelation 6, verse 6. Uh, and I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and wine 
um, interested in this because of wheat and oil. And back in the day when John wrote this, a denarius was a day's wage. And a quart of wheat, loosely, is how much it took to make a loaf of bread. Three loaves of barley. So, you know, one quart would roughly make a, um, a loaf of bread. So we're talking... You know, if you had a little money, you'd buy the wheat. If you didn't have as much money, you'd buy barley. You could get more loaves of bread for barley. And that's something that may get to be an issue at some point in the future. But, uh, you know, the context of this is is the uh, the third seal, Black Horse. And the, the point is, is we've got, it's going to cost a day's wage to, to eat. Um going to look at both of these oil. So you can see where this started. Uh, the invasion started roughly around February 25th. Price of oil was $91 and 59 cents a barrel. That's uh, West Texas crude or the New York mercantile price. It's the U S price. And here we are, what three, four days later. And we're already up uh, we've been as high as 107 bucks for a barrel of oil. We had some things happen today. People are refusing to buy Russian oil around the world, which is driving the price higher. Uh, and they're one of the largest producers of oil. And a lot of people are saying, you know what? We're not buying your oil anymore. Uh, the United States, for whatever reason. Now, Biden's supposed to be talking tonight. I'm competing with the State of the Union. This will be interesting. Let's see if he outdraws this, huh? Um, he says we're going to cut back on purchasing Russian oil. Well, I would hope so. We're just financing what he's doing. We don't need to be doing that. Um, and a lot of people are not buying Russian oil. So we're going to have a drawdown on the reserves other than Russian oil, which is going to drive the price of, of oil higher. Also, take a look at wheat futures. You know, that's roughly $10, 14 cents a bushel. Again, oh, things were going up, but but this started even a few days before the conflict started. You know, wheat was as cheap as eight thirty five a bushel. Now we're up to like ten twenty four a bushel, so that's a 25% gain. And you got to remember, some of these places, too, um, are already in trouble. Um, Russia and Ukraine are the primary grain producers for these North African and Arabian Peninsula countries in the Middle East. Uh, Egypt, I want to say Egypt accounts for, you know, they get their imports from Russia and, uh, Ukraine, like 80% of their imports. And they, a lot of these countries are already hurting too from an economic standpoint. Their currencies are getting crushed and continue to devalue, which is only driving the price of these things higher. And you can see real quick how uh, currencies being devalued. Uh, Turkey has cut off flow in the Dardanelles Straits and also in the Bosphorus Straits because of the uh, war to, uh, for to not allow passage of ships in and out of the Black Sea due to wartime activity north of them. They're kind of talking out of both sides of their mouth. I suspect they're probably letting a few things slide by. Somebody's paying attention to that. But um, if you can't export your grains from Ukraine or from Russia for that matter, and you've got to come through here, you got you got a whole bunch of people across North Africa, Middle East, who are going to be dependent on wheat. <clears throat> and estimates are they have anywhere from four to nine months of wheat left, which again is going to, you got a devaluing currency, plus you got um, limited supply, 
prices are going up and you can see real quick, you got a good swath of folks through here who are in hyperinflation and you're in a scenario that, that Revelation 6 verse 6 talks about and there's going to be some real suffering and, and people hungry. And the last time that happened, you know, we had a whole bunch of unrest started the Arab Spring back in 2011. And a lot of that had to do with high food prices, people protesting high food prices. And that's the kind of stuff that leads to revolutions. And then also we want to take a look at the Russian ruble. I mean, it's just getting destroyed. Uh, one Russian ruble is now worth less than a penny. And it's fallen off of a cliff. I mean, it wasn't in very good shape to begin with. But, you know, he, he can't buy anything. And, and that's, you know, with each passing day, uh, it becomes worth less and less. So it was, it was going to cost, what, $20, $20, $20 billion a day to finance uh, Putin's war machine? Well, with the, the destruction of the of the of the ruble, that that price is up at least what twenty four twenty eight billion a day. So his his currency is being devalued, making it harder to uh, finance his war efforts, and then also you have people refusing to buy his products. So even less money coming in than what was before. Less money, devalued currency equals desperate man. Makes me scary, scared for what he might decide to do to expedite this process, to gain control of some stuff. And I think it also speaks to, you know, what, uh, what takes place in uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39. And we'll take a look at that real quick and get a get a feel for that it, it the reason magog ancient magog invades israel is for uh economic reasons and we see that uh i believe it's in verse 13 off the top of my head yeah here we go sheba and Danan, that'd be modern day saudi arabia and the merchants of tarshish are loosely Europe, all its leaders will say to you, have you come to see spoil? Have you assembled your host to carry off plunder, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to seize great spoil? It's economic reasons why they come. Uh, now I'm of the opinion, and we're gonna, I'm going to get into this probably later in the week. going to do a, I've been getting some questions in and around Ezekiel 38, 39 verses uh, the Gog Magog invasion that we see here in Ezekiel 38 and 39, and also how that compares to the Gog Magog invasion that's talked about toward the tail end of Revelation. I think they're two separate events, a little teaser alert, and I'll get into that later why. But but the point being, it's economic purposes why, why Russia and friends come to invade. And I mean, this guy's burning, Putin's burning 25, 28 billion a day and he's looking for money in a hurry. Things aren't looking too good. So you can see where we got some conditions that could lead to hyperinflation real quick, especially for a good swath of North Africa, the Middle East, Russia, Ukraine. You're going to have a lot of people suffering high prices. And and then I also get, get these questions, and there's, there is a, a, a group of people you know, who, who believe in a pre-trib rapture and I'm in that camp. I believe in a pre-trib rapture, but I, I don't think it's one of, I'm, I'm not in line with the group of people who think it's just going to be all okay. And there's not going to be any difficult times and Jesus is just going to come get us. I mean, you can see right now we are on the verge of having some serious economic problems on this planet. And the longer this goes, the more disruption is going to be in regards to wine, or not wine, but oil and wheat. And I find it interesting that, that two of the three elements, or two of the four elements that are talked about are wheat, barley, 
uh, oil and wine. And price points, the two of these four are in the news today. And, and they are trending toward hyperinflation. We are trending toward a time for certain parts of the world um, where it's going to cost a day's wage to eat. And so, so for people to think that, that there's not going to be suffering, there aren't going to be difficult times before the rapture, I think that's, that's inaccurate. And I also would say that there's a group of people believers, part of the body of Christ, the church, in certain parts of the world that are living under a lot of hardship, you know, their lives are being threatened. And frankly, the church has been under assault for 2,000 years. It's us in the West and the United States and the body of Christ who frankly just had it the best. And we've never really had any hardship or suffering, unlike our, our fellow brothers and sisters in the body. Uh, you think about believers in Christ in places like Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, China, where, hey, they're not welcome and they're snuffed out. Damage is done to them. I mean, you see people were, you know, in Africa, they pour acid on believers. They kill people. They kill pastors for just preaching the word. Um, Rwanda, for crying out loud, in Africa, where Christians were slaughtered just because of what they believe. Now, we've we've been ridiculously blessed here in the United States and the West. We've not been persecuted. I mean, we get made fun of and mocked and scorned and giggled at and get called some cuss words. <clears throat> but we haven't been physically harmed. Uh, and the church has been under assault again for 2,000 years. So the, so the notion to think that the church is just going to walk scot-free into eternity without any kind of suffering or hardship I think that's inaccurate. Now, I will say this. We're not coming under the wrath of God. You know, we're not appointed to wrath. Christ Christ covered the, the price of sin, and he took that wrath upon him. So we're not going to suffer the wrath of God. Um, you know, and Jesus is the ultimate groom. We are the bride of Christ. Jesus is not going to allow his wife to be beaten and judged and physically maimed he's not going to allow that he died for that so i mean i will draw a line in that sense now don't get me wrong it's very difficult if you're on the if on the wrong end of this and say you are getting assaulted physically assaulted have acid poured on you beaten whatever somebody does to you to harm you because your beliefs that's going to be very difficult for somebody receiving that to say, well, you know, it's not the wrath of God, but you're hurting and you're, you know, you are being killed for the cause of Christ. I mean, either way you lose your life or you're physically hurt. Um, you know, those things are happening, have happened and will continue to happen and, and will increase with frequency prior to his return. And when he returns, and comes and gets his bride, be the resurrection of the dead first. So we'll have some little notification when, you know, the zombie apocalypse is not what some people think it's going to be. They're going to come up in white linen probably and ascend. Then those who are left will meet them in the clouds. But anyway, I divest. Um, and I will close with this. This is fascinating beyond belief. I want to take a look at the two leaders here. This is uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky here in the middle. He is Jewish. I find it interesting that the areas that sought independence from Ukraine and were pro-Russia, the separatists, most of the Jews in Ukraine are in those areas. Um. So there are Jewish figures that are key in this invasion, if you will. And Putin clearly doesn't like this guy. It seems to be very personal. But just look at this guy hanging out with the fellas. Looks like they're sipping a little tea. I don't know. It didn't, I wouldn't think that'd be coffee. But having a spread with, the, with his fellow, fellow soldiers. Hanging out with the people. And then you have this. 
this is uh, President Putin with his staff. And this is released by the Kremlin pool, Alexei, Alexei, Alexei Nikolsky, um, shot the photo. And this is what was released by, <clears throat> by Putin gang. This is what they want people to see. Um, <laughs> completely detached. You got the you got the camera down there at the end. You see all the tight shots of him. This that's him sitting there at the end of the of, of the table all by himself, isolates himself. I've had a lot of people ask, "What is this?" I have no idea. Maybe maybe that's something you know they can move the camera down, get a tight shot of him. I don't know. And had some of the commentary on these. I think these are probably for um, oh somebody speaking in a foreign language they can listen and get a translation is is the most plausible thing i've seen i've seen all sorts of clever stuff that said this looks like something out of a bond movie and he'll press the button and drop him through the floor to sharks or <laughs> whatever but that's what he wants to project to the world i mean apparently this is his idea of what leadership strength looks like a lot of people see isolation detached probably not too open to listening to somebody. Um, I've heard he's has some concerns with catching some diseases or whatever. I don't know, but just look at the difference. It's Russian leadership, Ukrainian leadership. And on that note, I'll close. Appreciate you guys taking the time following along. We'll keep you up to date as things become available. Um, you know, where is this going? Nobody knows. God knows. I would be very concerned if this, you know, they get their way in, in Ukraine and they make a sharp turn south and they want to really put some boots on the ground in the Middle East. I mean, they've roughly got 90, 95% of their military. They'd be in Russia around either Ukraine or down in Syria. I want to say they have at least 63,000 military personnel in Syria anywhere from 150 to 200,000 in and around the Ukraine. So it's a lot of stuff. And you read Ezekiel 38, 39, there's a lot of stuff down there in the, in the middle East around the promised land. So appreciate you guys following along. Take care. Have a good one. Bye.